welcome to the Reorient podcast. My name is Eva Gurska, your host and the founder of this podcast, in which I explore the intersection of culture and law through conversations with renowned scholars and experts. The goal of the podcast is to challenge stereotypes and share knowledge that is usually confined within the walls of academia. While most of the episodes are in Polish, I also seize the chance to converse with leading scholars in English. So, if you will enjoy this episode with Professor Iruz Braverman about her latest book on Palestine, Israel, be sure to check out my previous conversation with Professor Maurice Berger about his research on Islam in the West. My guest today is Iruz Braverman, professor of law and adjunct professor of geography at the State University of New York at Buffalo. Her main interests lie in the interdisciplinary study of law, geography and anthropology. She did ethnographic studies of illegal houses, trees, checkpoints, public toilets and zoos. In this conversation, we'll focus on her latest book, Settling Nature, the Conservation Regime in Palestine, Israel, which was published by University of Minnesota Press in 2023. Hi, Iruz. Nice to see you. Hi. Thank you for having me, Eva. Thank you for finding time and joining me today. I'm really glad we're doing this. And I'm really glad that, you know, we have a chance to talk about your latest book. Just for a tiny bit of background, you were finishing the book uh, when I was visiting you at Buffalo. It was a really nice trip and a research stay for me. It was great to learn from you. And it was really also really nice to see how you were focused on finishing that book. And right now it's out there. It's being read by people. We can talk about it. So I'm really happy we're doing this. Yeah, I'm I'm really happy that it's out there already because uh, now I don't have to worry about should I do this? Should I do that? It's It's like giving birth. It's out of my body right now. And that's, you know, I don't have to abstain from drinking alcohol at this point. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, so we will talk about the book and what it is exactly about. But first, I wanted to start a bit with who you are and your positionality. So you basically put that there in the introduction to your book. The first sentence is that in retrospect, I have been collecting materials for this book since my birth. So what do you mean by that? And what is your background and how do you approach this book or this subject? Well, so I was born in Jerusalem, very close to the uh, 1967 border. And When I was born, there was a tree that was planted in my name in the what's called Peace Forest. And uh, I traced the certificate for that. These are trees planted by the Jewish National Fund, a pine forest tree. And I wrote about that for my dissertation, which turned to be my first book in English way back. And that's kind of what I what I mean, that in, in fact, the project of even living in that landscape is already a political project, right? Demographically, you're counted as in a certain way. Trees are planted in your name that kind of take over the landscape. And then also there's a project of naturalizing and normalizing that landscape, especially when it comes to natural landscapes. And so I, I have been indoctrinated as a Jewish Israeli growing up under you know, Zionist influences, Zionist education, going to the military as well, being a nature instructor in the military. So all, all that, I, I was kind of part of the system that that naturalized the landscape as it is. And the entire project of my book is to uncover the naturalness of this landscape and denormalize it and show that, in fact, it is ideologically manufactured And that once we start seeing that, then then the naturalness dissipates. But when I say, yeah, I've been kind of working on that project since I was born, it's like, I don't mean like, oh, yeah, I had a pen when I was like <laughs> a week old and I was already taking ethnographic notes. But in a sense, yeah, because, 
you know, this is, I am an ethnographer, a legal ethnographer, and this is what's called insider ethnography, meaning this is where, well, at certain points, it's it's an insider ethnography. At other points, it's an outsider one, because now I don't live in that region any longer, and that has its own issues and benefits and problems. But but growing up there until the age of, what, uh, 30-something, probably mid-30s, uh, I was part of a system of being indoctrinated, but also struggling with some of these identities. So in that sense, I'm an insider to the process and reflecting on it uh, for and collecting information about it as a, just a being living in that space since since I was born. Was it easy to deconstruct it and look at it critically as an outsider or you being an insider actually made it harder? I think once, uh, well, uh, it's it's both probably, is, is probably the most accurate answer. As an insider, it was hard for me to get, sometimes it still takes me a little bit to get out of my head of like, oh, of course it is that way and to question some of my assumptions. And sometimes it's something that I still have to, with a lot of awareness focus on. On the other hand, being an insider gives me access, especially as a as a privileged insider, since I am I belong to the dominating Zionist European descent for the most part. My family is kind of mixed, but but in any case, that's the that's the hegemonic part of my family. So basically I come from that kind of education. And so and so it was easier for me to gain trust from the interlocutors that I set to to interview for this project. And in fact, again, a lot of them, or at least the initial ones, I came across not working for this project, but as somebody who was growing up and working and ha- building a career, specifically in env- as an environmental lawyer, I came across some of the scientists that I've worked with uh, since then. And some of them have been the, the people who have opened up the gates for me to be able to interview inside the probably most important governmental agency that works on nature management in what I call Palestine Israel, and that is the Israel Nature and Parks Authority. So I don't know that somebody who did not have my upbringing, who did not have, well, not just growing up there, but also just being part of the nature conservation activists or people who are involved in that. So I grew up knowing some of these people, working with some of the ornithologists. You know, you know how to, uh, you you kind of build trust with this community. So I'm part of it. And I'm also coming with a critique of some of the assumptions of this community. And this is why this process has been so challenging, because in a way, I do have very close connections to some of the interlocutors. And at certain points, I was honestly debating if I'm doing the right thing. I don't want to undermine the whole conservation project in this region. It's a very sensitive, delicate time for for biodiversity protection, for habitat protection, and I wouldn't want to undermine that. At the same time, it is important, I think, to make more transparent some of the underlying colonial assumptions and projects that are part of, of, of the conservation movement in this country. So I was always ethically kind of struggling with it. And honestly, it hasn't ended. There are still ongoing conversations. I just had one yesterday and it wasn't pleasant necessarily now that the book is out. You know, it's um, some of my claims are misunderstood, but some of them are understood very well and not liked very much. For example, even looking at it from a settler colonial perspective, although A lot of the people I worked with and interviewed are left wing against the occupation. They might be able to accept my critique with regard to the occupied Palestinian territories of 1967. To extend them to the 1948 areas is very difficult for for these for these people. And even if they do, then it's it's a limited recognition only in this part. Like so it just felt to me like. Hmm. It's very interesting where they draw the lines, but they don't see the whole structure as a settler colonial structure. They can admit to it here and there, but the way that I'm looking at it, the regime of conservation, as I call it, is actually something that furthers 
the settler colonial structure writ large through the entire area, through the entire region that bridges between the 1967 and 1948 areas and seep between them and connects some of the different legal regimes that operate in them. And, and I think that's blurry and ambiguous on purpose in a way. I mean, no, no one personal individual is responsible for it. I'm not like, it's not like they're trying to hide it, but in fact, I feel like sometimes it's obscured for them from them themselves, but you can't say that because here and here, and the interconnections seem to be missed. And so, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes I still question myself, am I seeing it the right way? Is it okay for me to say that when I've not lived in the country for 15 years or even more, and I'm not operating there? Maybe I'm, am I getting anything wrong? So I constantly ask myself these questions and I constantly go and visit and talk and stay in touch. So yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a really heart-wrenching gut-wrenching project to make sure that you're not causing harm by by doing the work that you, that you know that I'm not causing harm by doing this work you know that's i think why i asked the previous question about you being an outsider and an insider because me reading this book i had a feeling that you do get the whole picture a bit more As an outsider, you have the ability to see it all and be very critical, while your respondents, people you talk to in your book, they don't see it from my perspective because they are inside. They they do say it, and I think it repeats itself over and over, that they are not political, that they are there to protect nature that nature is is more important. They do have a lot of empathy for the nature and animals and flora and fauna. But at the same time, they are deep within the system, as you said, so they cannot really see it. So that's why I also asked about it. But when we are already talking about settler colonialism, I would like to go a bit into that direction. So... Usually settler colonialism is a term or or concept usually used when the research is being done or when we talk about something through a more of a political lens, a bit more of a social lens, when we talk about settlers going somewhere and taking over the territory, about dispossession of uh, native people. But here you talk about settler ecologies. You you coined this term. So where does the nature really come in? Where do you see it? I see it as being, and thank you for that question, because it's so central to this project. And so it's very important to highlight that exact issue that you're that you're inviting me to reflect on. So I see it as a very central. And in fact, uh, the centrality is exactly in that it is usually not considered part of the settler project. It's usually, again, we go usually with the flow of, well, nature, you know, it's so, it's so non-human and it's so uninflicted and it's so uncontaminated by our right doings and wrongdoings and whatever. Like, what does the bird have to do with it? What is, what does this cute gazelle have to do with it? But I'm showing throughout the process and slowly, slowly, I think through the stories, how very much it does have to do with it. How in fact, these non-human organisms, whether it's plants or animals and territory as well, are recruited. With territory, it's easier to understand, but with animals, sometimes it's very hard. Like what is the, well, we're just protecting birds and we're all, we all love birds. So what is the issue? But to realize that some animals are affiliated with the Zionist project and those animals are highlighted, are uh, highly protected through the law, are reintroduced into the landscape. It's those animals that perhaps, or not perhaps, that uh, remind the people who, who live in this place that this landscape is also a biblical landscape that resonates with an imaginary of the landscape as a land of milk and honey, maybe greening the desert, maybe reintroducing animals that could be seen as, as part of that biblical landscape. Maybe in the, in the case of the Jerusalem area, the terraces and the spring, the uh, water springs, those are all 
highlighted as part of the natural project, whereas different types of animals, let's uh, give examples, camels, donkeys, goats, black goats in particular, certain plants, those were affiliated with the Palestinian. And as such, they're not protected. Now, as it is, they're not considered wild and they're not protected because of that. And that's the claim. Well, those animals are not wild, so we don't need to protect the camel. It's not a wild animal, but it's not accidental that those are the animals of the Bedouins and those are the animals of the Palestinians. And so through that form of those privileges that are, that are granted to some animals, basically the ecological landscape takes part in the war. Uh, I call it ecological warfare. And so the camel is pitted against the wild ass. And I try to show that those elements, in fact, go to the heart of how colonialism and conservation are intertwined, not just in Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel, but in many other settings, because the whole separation between nature and culture, between nature and humans, this whole idea of keeping humans out has been provided as a, as a rationale for the making of national parks worldwide. And we hear the same stories that with, with Kruger Park in South Africa, with Yosemite Park in the United States, with parks in Australia, New Zealand, any place where the settlers arrived with this, you know, equipped with this ideology of wilderness means no humans, that also meant uh, that it needed to be made like that because it wasn't like that. There were people there, they were indigenous. So they either were eliminated or expelled, they were moved away from there. So this ties the Palestine project or the, the Zionist colonial project to other colonial projects and shows the underlying connections between ways of thinking. This is the colonial aspect of conservation that I highlight here that juxtaposes between wild and domesticated species. Like one of the scientists told me after the book came out, he's like, what do you want from me? Like anywhere else in the world, nobody's going to allow hybrid goldfinches into like, why? Yeah. And I'm not saying that it's, it only happens in Israel, but I'm trying to expose that, that some of these ideologies are ideologies that are tainted with problematic messages about the separation between humans and nature. And, um, and here they're taking to an extreme because it's happening right now. It's happening, the prohibition from the local Palestinians from entering into the national park, sometimes their own private property, especially in the occupied mm -hmm. territories. So uh, although I will say that it's only in some cases 20% or 40% of the territory that is private Palestinian territory, even in the occupied territories, but still the practice is the same in terms of who gets to enjoy those parks, who's allowed into them, and what kind of uh, landscape is produced here, who feels comfortable in that landscape. And so we see this story repeated again and again in, in Palestine, Israel. And I, I hope this helped and it wasn't too, um, too all over the place to clarify that really that the power of, of the ecological warfare is exactly in that it seems to be apolitical. That's its power. Because once people can't see its politics, then it's taken for granted and you're crazy for even mentioning it. Yeah. So, so it gets to be even more hegemonic, even more powerful by being naturalized that way. I also had the thought that, especially right now, because nature conservation and preservation seems like something that is very important for us globally, universally, it becomes more neutralized in a way. Like at the first glance, it seems very positive thing to do. What could go wrong if someone wants to create a natural park somewhere to, to protect nature? However, if you go to Israel-Palestine, if you go to occupied territories, you can see that there are actually people being losing their land, there's dispossession happening, there is what you call green grabbing, blue grabbing, animals also being introduced there. They take part in how life of other people is, is changed or prohibition of having certain animals, for example. So it, 
definitely your book shows that there is an issue there. But I would also like to unpack a bit the things that you mentioned. So, for example, the trouble or the tensions, you mentioned separation of nature and and humans, but I was thinking also about separation of nature from nature. Also, the examples of animals that you mentioned, because on one hand, we have this ideal of protecting or recreating biblical landscape. So, for example, you write about projects to reintroduce biblical animals back to the wild. And then those biblical animals are against other animals, I guess, non-biblical animals. Non-biblical animals are not important anymore. Their lives are not important anymore. They can be killed and no one will really care so much. But on the other hand, on the other level, you have wild animals versus domesticated animals. And then I really like the camel case. I hope you could actually talk a bit about the camel case. I think it is very, like, it shows it very well. But somehow I'm also now thinking that, you know, even thinking about biblical times, I cannot imagine that there were no donkeys or camels. I think technically they should still be important for that biblical landscape. But at the same time, because they are connected to certain humans, they're connected to Palestinians and Bedouins. Because of that, they lose their, I think, sometimes also right to live. Yeah, and I will say, you know, conservationists will say it's not because they're connected to those Palestinians, but it's because they're not wild. We just protect the wild animals. But then again, I say back to that, that whole separation between what is wild and what is not, the whole Puritan approach is in itself, I find problematic. So I, I want to reinforce that. But, but you know, the, the black goat is a good example. And although Israel Israeli conservationists have completely now come to say that they have made a horrible ecological mistake, it's a good example because I feel like, okay, that happened in retrospect. And when, uh, and... Um, uh, Can you but, tell but, the story? Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. yeah. So, so, um, so the black goat, the British already didn't really like the black goat. And the idea was that it was, uh, it, it kind of undermined the project of afforestation. So it would eat the small plants, especially of pine forest, which were the easiest ones to grow. And, uh, and the British loved to plant those. And then the Zionist project came and, and took it to a whole different level. But the goats, the horrible goats, they would go and they would eat those little seedlings or uh, th- those little plants. And they were deemed the enemy of the, what I call the ecological state, those black goats. Until now, there's narratives of, by uh, some settlers that I interviewed inside the occupied territories basically saying, you know, they can even eat rocks. They're horrible. They changed the landscape. Uh, they, now, the first, the first environmental protection law that came out in, in, uh, in Israel was the Plant Protection Act of 1950-something. Uh, so we can look at the year in a second. But um, but very early on, this basically, the, the, na- the other name for it is the Black Goat Act, because basically it gave permission to exterminate. So this is not just about, oh, these animals may be killed. No, this is about the act of killing, the act of exterminating a whole population of non-human animals what you know in the more theoretical literature is called also the necropolitics. So on the one hand, we're showing the biopolitics, the project of making certain life privileged and valued. But on the other hand, there's a, the con- conservation regimes have also a very strong and important project of killing lives that are deemed uh, non-valuable. And, and in this case, the goat was deemed as such. And in fact, the chief scientist then, and, and the one I worked with when I was an environmental lawyer, and I was actually fighting against the Jewish National Fund, I worked with her. She was the chief scientist for a long time, and the goat was her enemy. <laughs> it was, this was about how many goats can you bring, how many dead goats can you bring, and how much you'll get for every dead goat. Now, listen, these kinds of projects happen nowadays as well. You can take a look at cat killing in in various places in the world, uh, lionfish c- c- culling. You know, I was just in Puerto Rico, and and my the master diver was like, I wish I had my my um, 
exterminator thing. So we, because we saw like five lionfish during the dive. And yeah, so, so what I'm saying, this is a normal practice in conservation that certain animals and plants are deemed invasive, are deemed dangerous for the, for the natural uh, habitat, for the natural landscape. And those are deemed killable, not grievable, if to use kind of, again, uh, Foucauldian language or later interpretations of it, but, but, uh, but killable. And I don't know that I'm saying never, never kill. I'm just saying, let's be transparent about these decisions. But here in this case, so the goat was basically eliminated from the landscape by massive percentages. And there's barely any black goats left in this region. But of course, anybody can guess the outcomes of this story nowadays with fire regimes, with climate, with with hot climate, and also with all these forests that sometimes have this monoculture, not so much anymore, but now are even more exposed to fires. And so suddenly there's massive fires going on. And where's the goat? So suddenly the Israel Nature and Parks Authority needs itself to go in and introduce the goats back to the landscape and even train those Bedouins and Druze who don't know how to work with these goats anymore because they don't do that. So, this is so, so now it's, it's so funny, right? Suddenly the input people, the rangers are the ones who, who are like, no, no, we have to teach you how to work with the goats. So all this kind of, I mean, it is funny, but at the same time, it's so tragic because if it didn't cause such violence and such loss of not just life, non-human life, but also for humans, right? This was a whole livelihood for an entire community, not just a livelihood, but a way, a way of a culture. And that is kind of lost. And so, yeah, this was about the goat. This was about protection of the forest. But at the same time, it was about the criminalization of a, an entire human population, which was deemed as destructive for the environmental landscape. This is also something that is very much shared in other contexts as well in various parts of, uh, in various African countries. The locals were deemed to not be protecting the environment enough. So that was an excuse to take it from them and to manage it from them or to tell them how to do it right. And I feel like that kind of ecological exceptionalism, as I call it, is very, is very potent in the Zionist narrative as well. Well, they don't really know how to do it right. We'll teach them how to do it. They don't know how to protect the birds, so we have to do it for them, or or else it won't be, or else it won't be done properly and the birds will suffer. So in the name of basically, in the name of the birds comes this kind of I will, you don't do it. A declensionist narrative, as conservationists call it, basically, that undermines the native, that undermines local knowledge, and that elevates the uh, colonial knowledge above all, you know, the scientific, this particular scientific knowledge. Sounds totally like part of a old narrative of civilizational mission. We will go somewhere right. and teach them how to do it right. Um, exactly. Because we know better and it's positive that we will teach them whatever. Right, uh, right, right. It advances. Use. And especially here that it's done in the name of non-humans. So, so non-humans bridge a lot of this and take on a lot of the, you know, it's in the name of the gazelle. It's in the name of the, of the griffin vulture. And that gives so much power to those who claim it. We're not against the... So you're coming back to, your question before was really good. Like what, weren't there like camels and donkeys during biblical times? And so that was actually a really interesting argument that I even heard yesterday in the same conversation that I mentioned before. Like, what are you talking about? We're not against the Palestinians. Even Jews, if they would come with the camels or they come with a with a sheep, we'll, be, we'll definitely be against them. And that was, And that was exactly the claim that actually the lawyer for the Bedouin, whose camel was criminalized. So he was indicted. He was prosecuted by the state of Israel for allowing his camels to enter into the Mount uh, Negev Nature Reserve. The problem was the camels are not wild animals, and so they should not 
the state should not be giving water and food for his camels is the idea. If, if the camels are farmed animals, then he should provide their food and their water. And more than that, even, the problem was that they were frightening away the wild asses who were animal, biblical animals that were extirpated from the region in the last hundred years. They were brought in from Iran. And now they're pre the pregnant uh, female wild asses will not approach the water, at least that was uh, the claim, or will, will be driven out if they see the camels there. So then, again, like you said before, it's not about, the humans are not even involved. Here, the camel is the one driving away the wild ass. And so in order to protect the wild ass, you need to prohibit the camel from going in. So the issue becomes as if it's, as if it's a conflict between the wild ass and the camel, and that way it's removed from the human counterparts. And the claim by the ranger was that even, and by the lawyer, they all agreed that even if Abraham came on a camel, Abraham, the Jewish, you know, founder, uh, the father of, uh, of Judaism, I guess, as some refer to him, would come on a camel to the Hala Negev mountain nature reserve, he too would not be allowed in. And this is exactly the underlying egalitarian claim. We are not, this is not about Palestinians. This is about nature protection. It's apolitical. But when you just, when you just scratch the surface a little bit, you realize that in this context, at least, it is the Bedouins who own most of the camels. They are the ones who are suffering the most from this project. And I, I don't think that it's necessarily incidental. Now, it could be that in some cases, if Jews own camels, they will not be allowed in too. I mean, I don't think that takes away from the argument because this is about a structure. And the structure, again, undermines the domesticated, the, the farming animals and in, in this context and doesn't allow them in. Usually in, this, in these peripheral places of the state where a lot of the local Palestinian population dwells and Bedouin population in the semi-pastoral environment. These are uh, these are the animals that they work with, right? And so, I, I do feel like there is a pretty close, although not a hundred percent, affinity here between you know certain populations and certain animals, and a and a discriminatory practice when it comes to enforcement. To be honest, so you do see that that there that there will be a, a different way of enforcing it toward Jewish citizens. And I guess in this case, the example that I have is, is actually more toward territory. And that is when a national park, when a nature reserve is announced, is declared, is designated, if Palestinians even own private property there, they're not allowed to even sometimes in some cases even build a build a little shack or or something. However, you know when the Jewish settlers do that, then a lot of the times it will be extracted out of the nature reserve and in retrospect become under a different zone. And so, so this, I think, shows more than anything that, that there is a discriminatory nature between the populations when it comes to nature management in this region. I wonder if you ever thought also about a symbolic version of that story. Maybe it's a bit too psychological, but Looking at it from another perspective, you have a Asiatic wild ass who was extinct in that place. It survived elsewhere and it was reintroduced to come back to this land and it's considered vulnerable. Maybe not, it's, it's actually not dealing so well with the circumstances and the environment. It has to be helped a bit. You can see it's maybe not totally native to this land at this particular moment after the introduction. And against it, you have the camel that has been here also for ages, if not forever. It's well adapted. It's a native animal. And then you have a conflict over water. So if you look at it as symbolic more than as real, it actually reflects a bit the situation. And I, I can also understand how people from both sides would see themselves in these animals. Yeah, well, the way you told the story, then it does sound like it's a, the exact embodiment. However, it could be complicated a little bit. So, for example, the camel was actually likely not around 
for that long. I mean, 3,000 years. <laughs> it's a well. newcomer to the Middle East. I mean, and the wild ass was only extirpated in the last 100 years or so. So I just want to, you know, we can deal with the nuances. We don't have to make it a black and white completely. It doesn't have to completely line up. And I don't think it takes away from the argument. It could be a complicated argument. And and so whenever people are like, oh, but in this instance, this is not exactly right. I'm like, that's fine. So you're right that the wild ass needs to get subsidies, meaning human help to survive in this region. Also, don't forget that 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 the whole natural system gets subsidies all the time. There's constant intervention. I'll also add that, you know, the reintroduction itself is itself an act that involves violence, taking animals from a particular location. A lot of them die on the way. And this is, again, a global issue. Reintroductions, successful ones can sometimes mean 60% success, meaning 40% die. I mean, so the violence is inflicted and it's not necessarily, I'm not blaming the nature conservation, but I mean, the unfortunate aspect of this is that a lot of things are changing in natural habitats and we are responsible for them. So now we also have to be responsible for sometimes the restoration, their rehabilitation, which means we're even more involved. Fortress conservation or just removing ourselves from the environment is not necessarily even possible anymore. So our ways of thinking about those separations have to become more com complex as well. And I guess um, you are right about the conflict over water and, uh, you know, between, between the animals. And in fact, in that sense too, I think there was active involvement because some water holes were closed. Only one was open. It's, uh, you know, and so camels had to travel long ways to get there. Sometimes now they found new paths and they, they walk over commercial roads. And so suddenly there's accidents that have been caused. And again, the links have not been clear enough between those changes in the natural management of the environment and how suddenly camels became criminalized. Suddenly they become the reason for accidents. And so suddenly there are laws that require their registration, that require that chips be inserted so that, the, so that their owners can be identified. So there's a whole new new laws, camel regimes, and the idea is it doesn't really matter who owns them. Now we need to control them better. So that leads to further surveillance of uh, the Bedouin community that, of course, sees this as another alienation project from the state. This all enhances the alienation between the communities. And I guess the bottom line of my story is that once we come to be honest and transparent about both the historical legacies, the mistakes that were made historically, say with the black goat, say with certain national parks that maybe appropriated too much land. Maybe there are ways to do conservation slightly differently or not slightly, but deeply differently to realize the importance of the local communities for conservation management rather than creating their further alienation by deeming their animals non-legitimate in the landscape, by criminalizing owners for holding those animals, and then not allowing them uh, adequate space to raise those animals. So you're kind of pushing that community to, to be against nature, to be anti-nature. You're, you're, you're reinforcing the hate. And I don't think that will lead to a good place. So, so my book comes from a place of, in order to really successfully do conservation, there needs to be a lot more conversation about some of these affinities, some of these identities that are going on. So I am hopeful that local conservationists will actually read this and not be provoked by the settler colonial language to say, oh, this book is not for me, but maybe say, oh, you know, okay, I can see that this was done in Kruger. I can see it there. So why can't I see it here? Maybe I've got some sort of blindness because I'm so close to it. Um, maybe not all of my arguments are, you know, completely lined up black against white, but that there is a grain of truth here that conservation has been utilized too much, too, too closely for the political project. And in order to divorce it from that political project, there needs to be some sort of, of, of process of recognition of what has happened. 
like a sort of truth commission or something like that, you know, to uh, acknowledge some of the damage, some of the trauma that was caused. I'm writing now something, a story that has not come into the book, and that is about the Hula Valley, the drainage of the swamps in the Hula Valley. And a really unrecognized, I have never heard this story about the local Gawardina community that was there, that was basically eliminated from the landscape. I grew up half in Jerusalem and half in a Hula Valley in a, in a kibbutz up there, Hulata. My uncle was, in fact, you know, the, the head teacher there. I, I might not be remembering correctly, but I don't remember ever hearing about that community. You know, that violence of removing people, not mentioning, not commemorating them, I feel like that violence comes back to haunt us. If we, if we don't pay attention to that, then, then healing is, is going to be very hard. It's circular, right? But then what also is very strong in your book, especially at the end, and I think this is a very strong chapter, is the militarization. And I kind of called it to myself, you know, a toxic relationship with nature. So on one hand, the army is polluting environment like no one else. On mm -hmm. the other, there's this whole narrative of protecting the nature, knowing the nature, that this is part of what the army is there to do to protect. So I'm, I, I'm actually wondering if what you're talking about right now is, you know, is very soft, it's possible truth commissions, is mediation, is... Uh, mm. a dialogue between different mm. parties, different sides, and not only two sides, but also different people who see things when it comes to nature differently, because there are even conflicts between conservationists. Right, there are. Yeah, but then if you take the conservationists in Israel, who mostly also are connected to the military one way or the other, Mm -hmm. as part of it, in service, as advisors, because basically everyone in Israel is connected to the army, then can you untangle that? Can you get out of that toxic relationship mm. and heal it? That's a really good question. Yeah. You see, that's when I start feeling very depressed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, because, you know, as I was trying to figure out on what tone to end the book, on the one hand, there was that, that level of realizing how deeply saturated the connections between the military ideology and the nature ideology in this place with half of the spaces that are designated as reserves and parks also at the same time being closed military zones or training grounds. So that kind of overlap between military and nature is very strong in this region, which is a small space, you know, the army doesn't have, it's all in, in those spaces that are still not as urbanized, right? So they're all, it's kind of both nature and the military project happen in those places. And as you say, the military promotes itself as being the number one protector of nature, while at the same time, It's exempt from environmental laws. It pollutes heavily. You know, when tanks go into an area, it can they can destroy an ecosystem you know, within a short time. Sometimes the training causes burning of massive areas of forests, and the nature protectionists will have no say about that because the army and the military have a precedent. A security takes precedent. And sometimes I hear frustration from the nature of people I, I interview. Like, we told them not to go into this park. We told them not to shoot there. And you see now everything is, 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 is uh, burned and dead. So yeah, there are places of, of fissure, of, of breakages between that affinity between nature and military. Places where you see, ah, sometimes those places differ and military wants to proceed on a certain line and nature takes a different line. Say, the petition against the separation barrier by the nature uh, groups, including the governmental agency that was against the particular choices of, of the separation barrier, and in fact, against the entire barrier because of its ecological impact. So then you see one government agency going against the other, you know, the military, the strong military. But at the same time, like you say, some, some of this deep 
educational mission to to get everybody to love nature the way this Puritan nature, the way it is constructed by in the Zionist imaginary, to love that vulture in the sky, to protect it, to do everything for it, can be seen in a as a as a more instrumental strategy to connect people to the patriotic narrative, to make them feel love toward this piece of land and to make them be willing to die for it. So yes, it has been utilized with a lot of explicitly by uh, by the military. And in fact, some of the people I interviewed, and I included some of those quotes, were saying, there is no use protecting a piece of land. You need to love that land and that way you're you're going to be willing to die for it. So this is why nature protection is such a strong element of uh, of military education and and like I started this interview saying, I was part of that of that project. I was a nature educator in the army. This is what I was doing. I I was and you know, I still feel like there can and should be love toward those animals. It's not like I'm saying, "Oh no, those animals don't matter." I am trying to make more transparent some of the utility of those narratives, the underlying utility, and the non-democratic way that some of these protections are um, forwarded and, 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 and what other services they do. What happens when you pit the landscape, when you make the landscape into black and white, into rivalries? It's either them or us, this kind of Schmittian idea of like... <laughs> And that's where I feel like, no, we got to see the story in a bit of more of a complicated way. And then there can be a future to conservation that is also something that everybody can participate in more. And that, in fact, is happening. I, uh, when I was just in South Africa for a while, for a few months, I'm seeing and I hear that this is happening also in other places in the world, in Canada. There is more community conservation approaches where you bring the local people to be part. And you sometimes means also you need to change your conservation goals. You're not just imposing the idea of, oh, this is how conservation looks like. You also take other perceptions into account. Sometimes they don't fall exactly in line with the European conservation models. So it is a two-way process. It has to be, or else it's just another way of imposing the hegemonic narrative. And this is why I feel like the book uh, takes Palestine-Israel as a really strong case of the convergence of colonialism and conservation. But in fact, it's talking about a much broader project, the project of, of the birth of, of, of modern conservation as we know it, coming out of a European con- a colonial trajectory, and how can we unwed, dewed, divorce ourselves from that and move conservation so that conservation can be more workable to a much less bifurcated, much more nuanced place that we're in. Uh, We have to think about that for conservation, or even, you know, I might want to call it even a different project of conservation. Even the word itself has this romantization of of the past to conserve something. Like, I'm saying, let's open it up. What is it that we are privileging here, that we're valuing, Let's have those discussions. It kills me. I'm in a lot of nature conservation projects. I was just actually in the United uh, United States uh, National Parks Authority. I was just in a meeting and they were saying, and I'm with them, you know, how lonely they feel about doing climate change work, how they're attacked by the communities. They're sued for doing this and that. And I was just like, you're part of this alienation. Wake up. You know, you can't complain that people are not involved when you are blocking them out from being part of the conversation. There needs to be a democratization in the real deep sense of the conservation project. So I think this is a, this is a very powerful example for it, but I think this goes much beyond, you know, this region to, to, the, to the really dreadful impacts that are happening worldwide. I had one other thought here about your book and how it is universal and much more than Palestine and Israel, because I think there is a tension there that I felt more subconsciously until now. Now talking to you, I could place it a bit better. 
So on one hand, there is this love of nature, but at the same time, this love of nature is all the time constrained, either within the borders of a country, for example, so certain beings have a right to live, but only if they're inside specific terrains that we as people delineated, limited with what we call borders. So goldfinch can be alive in Jordan, but the moment it is smuggled to Israel, it has to be killed, for example. But at the same time, there's a limit to this love of nature with law. You write a lot about hyperlegalities. It is fascinating how everything is legalized. Every camel, every black goat, there is a law, there is a rule. And if something goes wrong, like with the camels, they go elsewhere because they don't have access to water because of one law, then they are criminalized with other laws. So it's as if someone would expect the animals to understand on one hand. But on the other, there is this oppression, legal oppression that limits this love of nature. Because I also can see that other people like us who care about nature more in general would feel, okay, this is a bit oppressive. This is limiting what we can do. So with that, somehow I have a feeling that your book can be very much generalized basically to any other conflicted border, but also any other legal conflict around nature that might happen also, because I would sometimes say that this is overly legalized. This is a bit too much. Yeah, that hyperlegality, as I call it, I I feel like, again, I spent some time in in South Africa and, and, and saw how the apartheid regime, too, was very, very hyperlegal. You know, it's not always that things happen through these formal laws and minute regulations. And here, it seems to be the case, and, and certain beings are in what's called a state of exception. They're not, they don't fall in this law, they don't fall in that law, they kind of are outsiders to the law. So... But I, I'll say, so So your question made me realize that we didn't really speak too much to the central argument of my book, because maybe because it's so central, I'm like done with saying it again and again. And that is that the dispossession and the settlement that occurs through conservation regimes happens in two ways. One is through the enclosure of territory, meaning the designation of national parks and nature reserves. And I speak about that being, you know, massive percentage of the land in Palestine, Israel, in fact, some 25% and growing by the day, are already designated as as green national parks or nature reserves. So this is a project of taking over space through through that designation of of a national park. That's one way, that one power, one strategy that the conservation regime has in its arsenal. But the other one, and that goes to your question, so bear with me for a second. The other one is the through the protection and the removal of protection or the unprotection of, like we said, organisms. So you protect, say, the griffin vulture. Now, this becomes interesting because the protection of these animals, you're right. I mean, the sovereign law occurs only within the, the space of the sovereign nation, but that's where it does become a little bit more interesting when, it, when it's uh, nature laws because sometimes those exceed the boundaries of the sovereign, whatever those are. And in the Israel's case, it's very uh, uh, ambiguous anyway, but we're not going to talk about that. Same the Endangered Species Act. Do you know that actually there's protection of species that extends this? We're talking about the United States here that extends the borders of the United States. Like wherever those species are, they are protected. And a United States citizen, if they harm them elsewhere, they can be trialed. So it's it goes beyond the territory. And I say, wow, look at this. It's such a powerful conservation strategy. I'm not trying to undermine it by saying it's a strategy or I use the the word technology because, again, I'm very impacted by influence by Foucauldian thinking. And and I feel like it's a technology of power. So when the griffin vulture is protected, the griffin vulture is not, she's not only protected in the park. She's not only protected in the domain of sovereign Israel, but she continues to be protected when she is with a GPS transmitter and she is above uh, Sudan or Saudi Arabia. And the Tel Aviv University scientists are continuing to follow her 
and doing so through environmental treaties and continuing to monitor and to protect her through the law in those areas much beyond the borders of the country. This is where I find it so fascinating. Of course, we're not speaking about uh, Israel sending rockets into Sudan or Saudi Arabia. It's just a Griffin vulture. But the presence of the Tel Aviv tagged Griffin vulture in Sudan, that is, that is a presence that is, that we shouldn't take for granted that legitimacy in the name of nature protection to then go to Sudan and tell Sudan, you have to behave in certain ways, according to these international treaties. And then come and say, we know better. You are not doing it right. You're shooting the birds there. You're, you're behaving badly. You know, we're doing it better. We'll teach you how to do it. This again goes back to that exceptionalism narrative and this narrative of European conservation being the right conservation model. And again, I'm not saying that it's necessarily not. I'm just saying it's not part of a discussion of how imperialism and colonialism continue to to be performed, to take place through environmental ideologies and, uh, and exposing that is really important. So you're right, borders are highly important. When sheep cannot cross between the 1967 and 1948 borders, Palestinian sheep, okay? They cannot, they cannot, they will be, they will be confiscated and they will be taken. And I've actually visited in those, in those sites where the sheep are awaiting their owners to come in and, and save them, but, or, or take them back. And, and usually they don't because it's so expensive, but so yes, borders are highly important, but also the conservation and protection of certain animal bodies that exceed borders is also utilized as a way to move beyond sovereign borders into other, other territories. And so I wanted to highlight that aspect of the story. So is there hope And what is the way forward? You mentioned that a bit before, but I would like to, to use a quote uh, from somewhere in the end of your book. Could we care for nature in ways that do not perpetuate the unjust legacies of this place? So my question is, could we care for nature in that ways? I think so. I believe so. I really, truly want to believe so, because otherwise I feel like there's no point. It does mean that we need to, to be very careful how we define nature, care for nature, who cares, who, how to care, what do we define as care? I mean, yeah, we need to, to be careful about our own assumptions of, of what matters and what doesn't. But I am at the heart of things I am myself a nature lover, a conservationist, and I feel like that's my motivation to be writing the book. And if I didn't think there was a way to unsettle nature, then I wouldn't write this book. That was That is the motivation. I don't think that necessarily it will happen very quickly, but maybe this is going to contribute a little one centimeter, <laughs> perhaps one millimeter in that direction. All right. Thank you so much for this conversation. I really liked it. I really liked your book. So I really encourage uh, anyone to, to look it online and read it. I really recommend it. So yeah, thank you again. Thank you so much for giving me this platform. And for people who are listening, feel free to reach out. There's also a 40% discount that I can give you so we can kind of post it together with a podcast. And thank you again. It's lovely to be in touch with you, Eva. And it's lovely that you're so nuanced and so aware of the details. So it's nice to be able to uh, to talk about these things. It, it just uh, it, it feels uh, very important to do so. so. Thank you. Thank you as well. And my guest today was Professor Iruz Braverman. You can find details of this conversation on my website, reorient.pl, and we can post also an email to Professor Braverman and discount code to use. This episode was made possible by donations from my patrons and matrons. If you would like to contribute and support the development of this project, you can do so through the Polish crowdfunding platform 
called Patronite at www.patronite.pl slash reorient. Thank you for your support. 